Right. I've now almost succeeded in finalising plans for our tour, so I'll bring you up to date with what I know. As you know, we're flying first to Munich on Monday the 4th. The flight is at 11.30, so it's too early to have lunch at the airport. I suggest we meet there for coffee at 10, which should give us plenty of time for breakfast before we leave home. When we arrive in Munich, we'll be met at the airport by Klaus Bauer. Klaus works for a tour operator, and he'll look after us for the time we'll be in Germany. He's already liaised with the managers of the theatres we're going to visit, and he's also arranged for an officer of the National Theatre in Munich to show us round the theatre one afternoon during our stay. Now, last time we discussed this trip, I didn't have the precise cost for hotel rooms, but now I have. The normal rate at the hotel where we're staying is 150 euros a night for a double room. I'd hoped to get that down to 120 euros, but in fact, I've been able to negotiate a rate of 110. That'll be reflected in the final payment, which you'll need to make by the end of this week. On Tuesday, the day after our arrival, I had hoped we could sit in on a rehearsal at one of the theatres, but unfortunately, that's proved very difficult to arrange. So instead, we'll have a coach trip to one of the amazing castles in the mountains south of Munich. On Tuesday evening, we'll all have dinner together in a restaurant near our hotel. From talking to you all about your preferences, it was clear that a typical local restaurant would be too meat-oriented for some of you. Some of you suggested an Italian restaurant, but I must confess that I decided to book a Lebanese one, as we have plenty of opportunities to go to an Italian restaurant at home. On Wednesday afternoon, the director of the play we're going to see that evening will talk to us at the theatre. She'll describe the whole process of producing a play, including how she chose the actors and as the play we're going to see is a modern one, how she worked with the playwright. Right, now I'd just like to make a few points about the plays we're going to see. Partly because it might influence your choice of clothes to take with you. The play we're seeing on Wednesday evening is a modern one, and we're going to the premiere. So it'll be quite a dressy occasion. Though, of course, you don't have to dress formally. I gather it's rather a multimedia production with amazing lighting effects and a soundtrack of electronic music. Though, unfortunately, the playwright is ill and is unlikely to be able to attend. On Thursday, we're seeing a play that was first performed last year when it was commissioned to mark a hundred years since the birth in the town of a well-known scientist. We're going to see a revival of that production, which aroused a lot of interest. Friday's play will really make you think hard about what clothes to pack, as it'll be in the garden of a palace. It's a beautiful setting, but I'd better warn you, there won't be much protection from the wind. On Saturday, we're going by coach to a theatre in another town, not far from Munich. This will be the opening of a drama festival, and the mayor and all the other dignitaries of the town will be attending. After the performance, the mayor is hosting a reception for all the audience, and there'll be a band playing traditional music of the region. And after having a day off on Sunday, our final play is on Monday, and it's in the stunning setting of the Old Town Hall, which dates back to the 14th century. The performance marks the 50 years that the lead actor has been on stage, 
and the play is the one where he made his first professional appearance all those years ago. And the day after that, we'll be flying back home. Now, have you got any questions before I... In this session in your training day, we're going to look at some of the more specialized holidays we offer at BC Travel. Now, the travel business is very competitive, and it's important to be aware of how the market's changing and developing. In terms of age groups, the over 65s are an important market, and one that's increasing steadily year on year. The fewest holidays are taken by the 31 to 42 year olds, and that figure shows no sign of rising. The biggest market at present is still the youngest group, the 16 to 30s, but this group's also seen the biggest drop over the last few years, whereas there's a noticeable growth in the number of holidays taken by the 55 to 64 year olds. As far as the 43 to 54 year olds are concerned, bookings there are steady, but I have to say we haven't seen the increase we expected. One trend we're noticing with nearly all age groups is the growing popularity of holidays in which clients do some kind of specialized activity. I'm not talking here about adventure holidays where clients take part in high-risk activities like white water rafting just for the thrill of it. Activity holidays usually involve rather less high-risk sports or things like art and music. They're not necessarily cheaper than ordinary holidays, often the opposite in fact, but they do often take place outside the main tourist centers, which gives an opportunity for clients to find out more about the local people and customs. And many say this is one of the most positive features of these holidays. Of course, they offer the chance to develop a new skill or talent, but clients often say that more than this, it's the chance to create lasting relationships with other like-minded people. That's the main draw. Let me give you some examples of BC travel activity holidays. Our painting holidays take place in four different centers in France and Italy, and they're very popular with clients of all abilities from beginners onwards. We've got an excellent team of artists to lead the classes, some of them have been with us from the start, and five additional ones will be joining us this year so that we can offer a greater number of classes in each center. As far as cooking holidays are concerned, I know a lot of agents offer holidays where clients cook recipes related to one particular country, usually the one they're staying in, but we focus on dishes from a great many different ones. Apart from that, you'll find the usual emphasis on good quality organic ingredients. That's more or less a given nowadays. And there are generally some meat-free recipes included. Our photography holidays take place in a wide range of countries from Iceland to Vietnam. And clients have the opportunity to see some stunning scenery. Groups are small, no more than eight, so clients can have one-on-one -on -one tuition during the holiday and excursions are arranged with fully trained guides. At the end of each holiday, an exhibition is held of the photographs taken so that clients can see one another's work and receive valuable feedback from the tutor. Finally, let me tell you about our fitness holidays. In Ireland and Italy, we run one-week general fitness classes for all ages and levels of fitness. Clients start the course with a consultation with a trainer, and together they draw up an individual program. As well as improving general fitness, clients find that they end up losing much of the stress they've built up in their daily lives. In Greece, we have a two-week holiday for clients who want to do something about their weight. This has all the features you'd expect, like a personalized diet program, but one of its most popular features is that the exercise classes are all held on the beach. People say it's far preferable to being in a gym. Finally, we offer several holidays in Morocco. One very popular one is the mountain biking holiday. Bikes are provided 
and there are different routes according to people's ability. We offer one which is tailored to the needs of families, which is particularly popular. Okay, so that's about all the time I have today, so thank you very much. Oh, good morning. Uh, you must be James. I'm Beth Cartwright. Please call me Beth. Thank you. Now, as this is your first tutorial since you started on the Scandinavian Studies course, I'd like to find out something about you. Why did you decide to take this course? Well, my mother is Danish, and although we always lived in England, she used to talk about her home a lot, and that made me want to visit Denmark. We hardly ever did, though. My mother usually went on her own. But whenever her relations or friends were in England, they always came to see us. I see. So I assume you already speak Danish, one of the languages you'll be studying? I can get by when I talk to people, though I'm not terribly accurate. Now, you probably know that you'll spend the third year of the course abroad. Have you had any thoughts about that? I'm really looking forward to it. And although Denmark seems the obvious place to go because of my family connections, I'd love to spend the time in Iceland. Oh, I'm sure it can be arranged. Do you have any plans for when you graduate? A lot of students go on to take a master's degree. I think the four years of the undergraduate course will be enough for me. I'm interested in journalism, and I quite like the idea of moving to Scandinavia and writing for magazines. I'd find that more creative than translating, which I suppose most graduates do. Okay. Now, how are you finding the courses you're taking this term, James? Well, I'm really enjoying the one on Swedish cinema. That'll continue next term. But the one on Scandinavian literature that's running at the moment will be replaced by more specialized courses. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in watching Danish television programs, there's going to be a course on that the term after next. That sounds good. Have you started thinking about the literature paper that you have to write in the next few weeks? Yes. My first choice would be to do something on the Icelandic sagas. Hmm. The trouble with that is that a lot of people choose that topic, and it can be difficult to get hold of the books you'll need. Why not leave that for another time? Right. You might find modern novels or 19th century playwrights interesting. I've read or seen several plays in translation, so that would be a good idea. Fine. I'll put you down for that topic. Right. So what would you advise me to aim at in the paper? First, I suggest you avoid taking one writer and going into a great deal of detail. That approach certainly has its place, but I think you first need to get an understanding of the literature in the context of the society in which it was produced, who it was written for, how it was published, and so on. I also think that's more fruitful than placing it within the history of the genre. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Could I ask for some advice about writing the paper I'm working on about the Vikings? I have to do that this week, and I'm a bit stuck. Of course. Have you decided yet what to write about? No, I haven't. There's so much that seems interesting. Viking settlement in other countries, trade, mythology. Well, what I suggest is that you read an assignment a student wrote last year, which is kept in the library. It's short and well-focused, and I'm sure you'll find it helpful. I'll give you the details in a moment. Textbooks usually cover so many topics, it can be very difficult to choose just one. Okay. I've got a DVD of the film about the Vikings that came out earlier this year. Should I watch that again? If it's the one I am thinking of, mm, I'd ignore it. It's more fantasy than reality. But I've got a recording of a documentary that you should watch. It makes some interesting and provocative points, which I think will help you to focus your topic. Right. So then, should I work out an outline? Yes. Just headings for different sections at this stage. And then you should start looking for suitable articles and books to draw on and take notes which you organize according to those headings. I see. Then put short phrases and sentences as bullet points under each heading. Make sure that this skeleton makes sense and flows properly before writing up the paper in full. Okay. Thanks. That's very helpful.
Dave, I'm worried about our case study. I've done a bit of reading, but I'm not sure what's involved in actually writing a case study. I missed the lecture where Dr. Baker talked us through it. OK, well, it's quite straightforward. We've got our focus. That's tourism at the Horton Castle site. And you said you'd done some reading about it? Yes, I found some articles and made notes of the main points. Did you remember to keep a record of where you got the information from? Sure. I know what a pain it is when you forget that. OK, so we can compare what we've read. Then we have to decide on a particular problem or need at our site. And then think about who we're going to interview to get more information. OK. So who'd that be? The people who work there? And presumably some of the tourists too? Yes, both those groups. So we'll have to go to the site to do that, I suppose. But we might also do some of our interviewing away from the site. We could even contact some people here in the city, like administrators involved in overseeing tourism. OK, so we'll need to think about our interview questions and fix times and places for the meetings. It's all going to take a lot of time. Mm. And if we can, we should ask our interviewees if they can bring along some numerical data that we can add to support our findings. And photographs? I think we have plenty of those already. But Dr Baker also said we have to establish with our interviewees whether we can identify them in our case study or whether they want to be anonymous. Oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. OK, once we've got all this information, I suppose we have to analyse it. Yes, put it all together and choose what's relevant to the problem we're focusing on and analyse that carefully to find out if we can identify any trends or regularities there. That's the main thing at this stage, rather than concentrating on details or lots of facts. OK, and then once we've analysed that, what next? Well, then we need to think about what we do with the data we've selected to make it as clear as possible to our readers. Things like graphs or tables or charts. Right. Then the case study itself is mostly quite standard. We begin by presenting the problem and giving some background, then go through the main sections. But the thing that surprised me is that in a normal report, we'd end with some suggestions to deal with the problem or need we identified. But in a case study, we end up with a question or a series of questions to our readers and they decide what ought to be done. Oh, I hadn't realised that. So, basically, the problem we're addressing in our case study of the Horton Castle site is why so few tourists are visiting it. And we'll find out more from our interviews but I did find one report on the internet that suggested that one reason might be because, as far as transport goes, access is difficult. I read that too, but that report was actually written ten years ago, when the road there was really bad, but that's been improved now. And I think there's plenty of fascinating stuff there for a really good day out, but you'd never realise it from the castle website. Maybe that's the problem. Yes, it's really dry and boring. I read somewhere a suggestion that what the castle needs is a visitor centre. So we could have a look for some information about that on the internet. What would we need to know? Well, who'd use it for a start? It'd be good to know what categories the visitors fell into too, like school parties or retired people. But I think we'd have to talk to staff to get that information. OK. And as we're thinking of suggesting a visitor centre, we'd also have to look at potential problems. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be cheap to set up. No, but it could be a really good investment. And as it's on a historical site, it'd need to get special planning permission, I expect. That might be hard. Right. 
especially as the only possible place for it would be at the entrance, and that's right in front of the castle. Hmm. But it could be a good thing for the town of Horton. At present, it's a bit of a ghost town. Once they've left school and got any skills or qualifications, the young people all get out as fast as they can to get jobs in the city. And the only people left are children and those who've retired. Right. Something else we could investigate would be the potential damage that tourists might cause to the castle site. I mean, their environmental impact. At present, the tourists can just wander around wherever they want. But if numbers increase, there might have to be some restrictions, like sticking to marked ways. And there'd need to be guides and wardens around to make sure these are enforced. Yes, we could look at that too. Okay, well, we said... In the last few weeks, we've been looking at various aspects of the social history of London. And this morning, we're continuing with a look at life in the area called the East End. I'll start with a brief history of the district and then focus on life in the first half of the 20th century. Back in the 1st to the 4th centuries AD, when the Romans controlled England, London grew into a town of 45,000 people. And what's now the East End, the area by the River Thames and along the road heading northeast from London to the coast, consisted of farmland with crops and livestock, which helped to feed that population. The Romans left in 410, at the beginning of the 5th century, and from then onwards, the country suffered a series of invasions by tribes from present-day Germany and Denmark, the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, many of whom settled in the East End. The technology they introduced meant that metal and leather goods were produced there for the first time. And as the East End was by the river, ships could transport goods between there and foreign markets. In the 11th century, in 1066 to be precise, the Normans conquered England, and during the next few centuries, London became one of the most powerful and prosperous cities in Europe. The East End benefited from this, and because there were fewer restrictions there than in the city itself, plenty of newcomers settled there from abroad, bringing their skills as workers, merchants or moneylenders during the next few hundred years. In the 16th century, the first dock was dug, where ships were constructed eventually making the East End the focus of massive international trade. And in the late 16th century, when much of the rest of England was suffering economically, a lot of agricultural workers came to the East End to look for alternative work. In the 17th century, the East End was still a series of separate, semi-rural settlements. There was a shortage of accommodation, so marshland was drained and built on to house the large numbers of people now living there. By the 19th century, London was the busiest port in the world, and this became the main source of employment in the East End. Those who could afford to live in more pleasant surroundings moved out, and the area became one where the vast majority of people lived in extreme poverty and suffered from appalling sanitary conditions. That brief outline takes us to the beginning of the 20th century, and now we'll turn to housing. At the beginning of the century, Living conditions for the majority of working people in East London were very basic indeed. Houses were crowded closely together and usually very badly built because there was no regulation. But the poor and needy were attracted by the possibility of work and they had to be housed. It was the availability rather than the condition of the housing that was the major concern for tenants and landlords alike. Few houses had electricity at this time so other sources of power were used, like coal for the fires which heated perhaps just one room. Of course, the smoke from these contributed a great deal to the air pollution for which London used to be famous. A tiny, damp, unhealthy house like this might well be occupied by two full families, possibly including several children, grandparents, aunts and uncles. Now, before I go on to health implications of this way of life, I'll say something about food and nutrition. Many believe that the story first began in America in 1877, when two friends were arguing over whether a horse ever had all four feet or hooves off the ground when it galloped. To settle the bet, 
a photographer was asked to photograph a horse galloping, and the bet was settled because you could see that all the hooves were off the ground in some of the photos. What was even more interesting was that if the photos were shown in quick succession, the horse looked like it was running. In other words, moving pictures. The person who became interested in taking the moving pictures to its next step was the famous American inventor Thomas Edison. Actually, he didn't do the work himself, but rather asked a young Scotsman in his employ to design a system, which he did. Now, this young fellow was clever, because the first thing he did was study other systems, primitive as they were, of moving pictures, and then put all the existing technologies together to make the first entire motion picture system. He designed a camera, a projection device, and the film. The system was first shown in New York in 1894 and was really very popular. Apparently, people lined up around the block to see the wonderful new invention. There were, however, a couple of problems with the system. The camera weighed over 200 kilograms, and only one person at a time could see the film. Well, now, news of the new system in America traveled fast, and a number of rival European systems started to appear once people had heard about it. The single problem with all the systems was they couldn't really project the film onto a screen, you know, so more than one person could see it. Then, in 1895, three systems were all developed, more or less at the same time and independently of each other. I guess the most famous of these was by the Lumiere brothers from France, and they called their system the cinematograph. Which of course is where the word cinema comes from. There were also two brothers in Germany who developed a successful system, and they called it a bioscope. Well, now once the problem of projection had been solved, the next challenge for the inventors was to make the films longer and more interesting. A continuing problem at the time was that the films had a tendency to break when they were being played, a problem which was caused by the tension between the two wheels, or reels as they are called, which hold the film. Now, this problem was solved by two American brothers. They developed the Lanthanum loop, which was the simple addition of a third reel between the two main reels. And this took all the tension away, with the result that the film stopped snapping. So now there was a real possibility of having films of more than two or three minutes, and this led to the making of the Great Train Robbery, the very first movie made. It only lasted eleven minutes, but was an absolute sensation. And there were cases of people watching the movie and actually fainting when the character fired a gun at the camera. Almost overnight, movies became a craze, and by 1905, people in America were lining up to see movies in store theaters, as they were called then. I guess the next big step in terms of development of technology was to have people actually talking on the film. And the first step towards this was in 1926, when sound effects were first used on a film. It wasn't until the following year, however, that the first talkie, as they were called then, was made. This film featured actors speaking only during parts of the film, and was called the Jazz Singer. And it wasn't until 1928 that the first all-talking film was produced, and this was called The Lights of New York. Unfortunately, the sound on this early film was not very good, and I believe they put subtitles on the film. That is, they printed the dialogue along the bottom of the film to compensate for this poor sound quality. Now, with the addition of sound, moving pictures became far more difficult to make.